So today we begin someone smarter than me, um, a, a different person's poetry, um, someone who is an actual poet who I had, weirdly enough, never heard of. Things like, occurrences like this really make me understand that my literary education has so many gaps. And, you know, there have been a lot of books, which brings me a lot of comfort, actually. There have been a lot of books in the history of time, a lot of poems, a lot of poets, a lot of writers, and there's no way you can read or know them all. But I am so disappointed looking into this today that I had no idea who this person was, had never heard of them, had never heard of their work, and now I'm, you know, thinking about going to the local bookstore shortly and picking up a few things, because if anything is as good as this poem is, um, I'm going to be be falling off my chair quite often. So today for you I have For the Young Who Want To by Marge Piercy. Talent is what they say you have after the novel is published and favorably reviewed. Beforehand, what you have is a tedious delusion, a hobby like knitting. Work is what you have done after the play is produced and the audience claps. Before that, friends keep asking when you are planning to go out and get a job. Genius is what they know you had after the third volume of Remarkable Poems. Earlier, they accuse you of withdrawing, ask why you don't have a baby, and call you a bum. The reason people want MFAs take workshops with fancy names when all you can really learn is a few techniques, typing instructions, and somebody else's mannerisms is that every artist lacks a license to hang on the wall like your optician, your vet, proving you may be a clumsy sadist whose fillings fall into the stew, but you're a certified dentist. The real writer is one who really writes. Talent is an invention like phlogiston after the fact of fire. Work is its own cure. You have to like it better than being loved. Work is its own cure. You have to like it better than being loved. Oh my god, I nearly dropped my phone on my face. Yes, I came across this poem on Instagram. Someone luckily stared, shared it in the, their Instagram story and I came across it. Just, you know, watching Instagram when I do before bed after I've stayed up till 2 a.m. writing and I'm too tired to even, you know, barely stare at this glowing screen that for some reason I feel obligated to do so. Um, but, you know, it's worth being on Instagram at 2 a.m. in the morning before bed to discover a poem like this one that just... My God, if I was wearing socks, they've knocked right off. And I just felt like this poem was speaking right to me. Well, of course, now I look this up now and I discover that this is a very, very famous poem and that everyone learns about it and just not me for some reason. So I've really just missed the boat on this one. Uh, but I'm not alone in relating to the words of this poem. But talent is what they say you have after the novel is published. Beforehand, what you have is a delusion, a hobby like knitting. Pretty much explains how I like that. Mm, I feel like that all the time that I'm an, I'm, I'm an unpublished author. I spend my happiest hours writing. I spend many hours now writing. I feel guilty about that sometimes because I think if this never comes to anything, I might as well have just been sitting here knitting, you know? And there's nothing wrong with knitting, I, but I, just, I see the comparison that is being made here, you know? Um, it's like this work that you do until someone else says it's worthwhile means nothing. So it has to mean a lot to you, right? You have to like it better than being loved. And I certainly think sometimes at my best, I do. Work is its own cure. You have to like it better than being loved. And I read this poem recently, and then I went and saw Little Women, as I mentioned in my last video. And, you know, Joe has an entire monologue where she's kind of second guessing her decision to not settle down with her best friend because she didn't love him um, and because she wanted her freedom and her freedom to work and write the way that she prefers to work and write. And it's very clear in this version of the story, they portray Joe as getting quite consumed by her writing. Like suddenly, you know, inspiration will strike and she's up all night and the cinematography in these portions is amazing, but also so feels so familiar to me because 
sometimes writing will just take over my life and my brain and the moments, darkest moments for me, the darkest low points in um, weeks or months in the last few years have been when I said, sorry, I don't have time. No, not for you. <laughs> like, not today. No writing. You have to go in the back. And when you can just say, all right, and go for it. I mean, the first time I really gave myself permission to just let writing take over my brain like a fever, I wrote an entire book in like six or eight weeks or something. Like uh, my first novel, my first complete novel that I wrote, I wrote very quickly and I wrote as if in a serious fever. I woke up and wrote. I went to bed late, uh, you know, turning the light back on to scribble down more notes, more dialogue. It just took over my brain. And, you know, people were looking at me like, wow, she's really into her hobby. And it will always be that way until it's published. And I think that's why I have such a huge desire for traditional publishing. People a lot of the time, especially on this series here on YouTube, tell me, why don't you just self-publish? And it's like, because my brain wants that MFA, that certification to hang on the wall that says, someone says, this person counts as a writer. I don't, you know, self-publishing in some ways is very in tune with this poem in the sense of like, uh, this poem is trying to say that talent is only bestowed on people uh, after the fact, you know, when so many people probably have quote unquote talent, but if it is not recognized, it is not named. And so self-publishing in some ways is saying like, I don't have to wait for anyone else's approval to put my work out there and someone might like it or and someone might not, but it's going to be out there. And I say, I'm a writer. God damn it. Here it is. And there is something to be admired there for sure. And, but I think a lot, I, I, I think there are other reasons to be interested in traditional publishing other than just this pride factor. But for me, I'm well aware that a lot of the reason I want to publish traditionally is because I want that stamp of approval saying this person is a real writer. They're traditionally published. I don't know. Anyway, this was another rambling entry for you. I hope you uh, don't mind. lights in here off but like my fancy ikea by the way rainbow lights on and uh my ring light on a little bit but i feel like i'm very orange but i can fix that in post hopefully um we'll see it's you know trying something different with lighting today i was playing around with the lights today that's what was going on in this video i don't video i don't know why so 2020 goals um basically of course you know the beginning of this video uh, kind of a continuation of some of my thoughts in my last video, but I, you know, have a goal to write. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, last year I said I don't have specific writing goals, but, uh, I, and I, and I don't, but I do always want to reaffirm for myself that it is my goal to, to do the work, to write, um, and that I need to make time to do so and allow myself to do so because it is what makes me happy and I should like to be happy as opposed to the alternative, weirdly enough. But my actual goals for the year, you know, like I normally do here, we will go into my paper section, um, is to actively pursue finding a literary agent. Now this is going to require me rewriting my query letter because I'm sure that thing needs work. I think I totaled, uh, not last year, because as I mentioned in 2019, I didn't actually send any query letters to any agents or do any research or any movement in this area. Um, but back in 2018, I queried, I think it was six or seven agents that I had researched. Um, and I think I only heard back from three or four um, with just form rejections. So clearly my first query letter was not a success because you want to hear back from everybody. God, please at least uh, get a form rejection from everyone or get um, personalized rejections is what it's called when people take the time to really 
look at your materials. Obviously, you sparked some interest um, and then tell you why they're not interested. Um, and I said that my goal for 2019 was to get personalized rejections. And because I did not even send any query letters out, I did not get any rejections of any kind, um, thankfully, which again, was kind of needed. But this year, I really plan on getting some personalized rejections, hopefully, because I plan on querying to a lot more agents, but that does require me to rewrite my query letter. Um, I might try submitting it to Query Shark this time. Um, it's a website that is run by a literary agent where she critiques query letters and helps people figure out what where they're going wrong. Uh, again, the query letter in itself, it's like a cover letter for a job. Um, you're just kind of trying to sell your idea, your book, your project, kind of pitch it to agents so that they might read your work and hopefully be interested in it and be interested in representing you. Um, for like for going looking into publication I can't talk um, so you it's a different skill than writing stories in many ways um, you know writing a good pitch is like a marketing skill as opposed to a storytelling skill in some ways I mean it is still storytelling you're trying to hook people into your idea but in very few words and in a very strangely formal and sometimes nitpicky requirement way um, so query letters, they're a task and a half, and I'm really excited to <laughs> spend a lot of this year on them. Hopefully, uh, I need to though, because last year, again, this was my main goal last year and I didn't do anything. So this year I'm making it my main goal again, and I better get it together and rewrite my query letter as many times as it needs until people start paying attention to it. Um, again, at least just reject me personally, please. Honestly, none of these form rejections. That's just... That means I piqued no interest at all. That's not cool. Now, in regards to the aforementioned slight loneliness uh, that I've realized, possibly I feel, I feel like for a long time I denied that I was lonely to other people and to myself, but I I would like, I have like some really good friends, but I would, I don't have any friends who like, like vintage or into the same kind of like media I am. Um, I, IRL friends. Of course, I have like acquaintances and like friends online, but I don't have people in my daily life, my life, IRL, um, who share my same interests much, or I don't have any queer friends, which I feel like could really help me out. Uh, things like that. So I want to make more friends this year. Um, it's a goal of mine to make more friends, uh, seek out community a little bit more, in general in my life and to then of course possibly date um i should probably do a whole video about this because i guess it makes me a bit of a curiosity uh but i have not ever really dated i think i've been on like three or four dates in my whole life just because i never had crushes on people so it seemed like a silly thing to do if you didn't like anybody that way to go on dates but now what i realized you know i've realized a lot of things about myself in the past let's say five years that um, really opened up my eyes to what I was closing my eyes to. Does that make any sense? Probably not. Um, we'll see. Uh, I just think I need to do better at putting myself out there, both in the arena of friendship and possibly more than friendship as well. Um, I'm sure that will elicit some question from people who are like, but you're ace. Don't you like not care about love? And it's like, that's not the same thing. Uh, sexuality and desiring companionship <laughs> or like the desire for companionship I don't think are the same urge but I digress not not for this video it's not a topic for this video you guys as for YouTube goals for 2020 of course I would like to grow my channel um, but more importantly I think I just need to keep refining and working on what I exactly I want to make in the sense that um, my content uh, some of it like does like I feel like the peaks and the valleys are quite high and quite low in the sense of like I haven't figured out a good balance necessarily for um, things that I love to make versus things that do well uh, and I don't put up anything that I like hate or um, I don't make any videos that I'm like not in some way excited about um, but I definitely have different levels of excitement or different levels of in like creative engagement with different videos here on the channel obviously my lookbooks are much more of like uh, an expression of artistic fervor <laughs> and like uh, let me be more creative than something like say a haul does although I do still like making hauls uh, they do the best on the channel by the way still um, I think the algorithm just 
pushes hauls like the, it sees the word thrifting thrift or haul and those videos do the best because there have been many viral videos that include those search terms and things like that so youtube the platform the ai itself pushes those videos more it's not like i don't even think it's that necessarily my subscribers like a haul more or people who actually watch my channel are interested more in a haul than they are in something else. I just think that YouTube's algorithm pushes it more and that's why they end up getting more views. At least that's my understanding. Um, I do like doing hauls because I like the idea that I can, that maybe, because my eye is, wow, this is gonna sound really pretentious and like inflated. I feel like my eye is trained, uh, you know, when it comes to looking at used clothing and seeing its potential. Um, <laughs> so I like that in those videos I can show like different ways to style things that people may pass by at the thrift store that they don't realize can be styled in such a vintage way or things that people are like ooh 80s and it's like well you'd be surprised how 50s you can make that 80s blouse look if you style it like this um, and that's kind of the fun sort of mm, creative part of those videos I guess is the styling portion of it um, but it is weird that hauls do so much better than anything else but that's always been weird to me um, I do like watching other people's hauls by the way so I, I get the appeal completely um, because I I like seeing nice, pretty things. And even if I don't get to have them, I like other people getting to see and play with and have nice, pretty things. I don't know. Humans are weird. Maybe it's like a, just a certain magpie tendency to like collect shiny objects. I don't know. But yeah, I want to get better at um, balancing the different types of content on my channel. I want to improve the content on my channel. I always want to be growing and doing better. Um, I want to like improve how I make my sewing videos. I want them, you know, hopefully I'll improve my teaching technique as it were when it comes to pattern drafting and sewing videos so that I can confer more information in less rambly time in some ways. Although some people, most people seem to like the long videos. So I guess it's not really a problem that often my videos come out super long when it comes to those instructional things, but I always want to get better at teaching and stuff like that. So that's something I would like to work on as well. And of course, uh, as far as like the closet historian as a business idea, um, in general goes, I would like to, again, work towards financial stability for myself and sustainability for my quote unquote brand, um, in the sense that like diversifying where my income, I, I, I mean, I put it in quotes, but like it is my income. It's just though small and I can't live off of it. Um, but I would like to, of course, improve that so that I can live off of it and like have my own separate financial life, um, which I don't have now, as we know here on this series. Um, so things involved in that include like, you know, having both the Etsy shop and YouTube, and I will be hopefully here launching Patreon a real soon. So for those of you who have been begging me, thank you. You are the best, obviously. I just like, I mean, I can't thank you for offering to help me. That is, I mean, like the most kind thing humans do, I think. And one of the more human things that we do is offer to help one another. So thank you. Um, and that will be coming very soon here. Um, so diversifying where I am potentially can be making income and then hopefully building it all together into being an actual income um, would be a good goal for the year. But like, again, I'm not setting specific goals anymore. I just have like good vibes that I'm hoping for because specific goals just let, I don't know, it's, it's not, I'm not feeling it this year. And I would still like to offer my sewing patterns for sale, but it just requires having them sent out to be professionally sized because I don't know how to do it. I don't have time to learn right now with the other things I have going on. I don't have time to devote to learning how to do pattern grading well enough that I would feel good selling a pattern that I made in like a different size to someone of that size and hope it works for them. Like, I just don't think I'm confident in being able to learn pattern grading that well with the amount of time that I have for it, which is zero. So the only way I can offer my patterns for sale right now would be to offer only the size that I make for me. Um, and that's not very inclusive now, is it? Um, so I would like to have everything sized, you know, several sizes smaller, many sizes bigger as well. So. The only way to do that is to have that professionally done and that costs of course a lot of money um so hopefully with things like patreon and if the channel grows this year um if the etsy shop does well this year i can put aside some money to maybe send out one of my sewing patterns and work with the company to have the patterns graded and like the pdf files put together so that i can print them and that people can print them at home um, so i can have both digital and paper copies available but this is just a, it's a big project that i don't 
totally have time for, but if, you know, you can buy time if you have money. So if I can save enough money, um, if I can get my business uh, to be a level where it sustains me plus new ideas, I would like, that's the first idea I would like to put money into. So we'll see. Uh, it's kind of dependent on what I can afford to do in this area, unfortunately. I just realized the color of light behind me is going to change because there's no way this is going to be one take. I try sometimes, but I am a rambly, stumble over my words kind of person, so there's going to be cuts. Who are we kidding? And finally, again, I just want to make the time to write this year. Um, like la last year, I didn't set myself the goal to finish the book that I ended up finishing in 2019. I had about 50-ish thousand words of that book going into, it's called The Cicada. We're just going to call it what I call it. The name will probably change by the time, if and when that ever gets published. Um, I wrote a book called The Cicada last year, um, and I had about 50,000 words of that written before I went into 2019, and then last spring through end of July, I finished writing it. It's much longer now. It's 190,000 words right now, which is a huge problem. I need to cut out a lot. Um, part of the reason I'm really focusing on other stuff right now and letting that draft sit is because I don't know how I'm going to cut out half a book from that book. <laughs> so, and it can't, it doesn't, I don't think it logically splits in two, so I don't know what's going to happen with that project, but God, did I have a good time writing it. Um, and now I have, again, I have about 10,000 words of a new project in that same universe. Uh, then I have about 60,000 words of a prequel for that same universe written. So having a lot of fun playing around with that stuff. And I know I like ta was talking about very literary things in the beginning of this video, um, but I don't consider my own writing to be literary fiction, as in the genre of literary fiction, which is like, you know, higher than every other genre. <laughs> I, I definitely write more genre-ish fiction, which is what it's called. I write speculative fiction as of right now. I've written like um, historical fiction with like paranormal elements as well. I write I used to write thinking that I was writing young adult, but now I, I'm pretty sure all my work is counts as like either, um, what do they, what do they call it? Like emerging adult or like it's past young adult. Uh, I don't remember what this genre is called. I'll put it on the screen here. It's, but it's like not completely adult fiction and not completely young adult fiction, but I don't write about teenagers. So my work counts as adult fiction, I think. Um, but whatever, like, you know, all that crap is just <laughs> kind of invented for ways to categorize books to sell them, not necessarily because work falls neatly into baskets ever. Um, but I, again, I, I write, I think I talk about writing very seriously here on the channel because it feels very serious to me. And this is, um, in this series is like where I talk quite personally about how I feel about the work. Um, but the work itself is, is not, you know, I don't know, what's a good example? It's not like, you know, classic literature um, in any way. It's much more like flashbang <laughs> and like is kind of violent and they curse a lot in my books. And yeah, I mean, I hopefully you'll see one day what I mean. But uh, I, I think the reason I talk about it quite seriously here in this series is because it, even if the work itself, again, isn't serious, it feels that way to me. Now I'm just being repetitive. You know what? Uh, I'm rambling. I can tell. I can't put my words together here just talking. So I'm going to read you my notes. Sorry. Um, in 2020, I want to write like it is the cure that I find it to be. Write like it will never matter to anyone else. Write because, uh, don't be an idiot, making the time to write is how you love yourself best. January is probably a pretty big month for self-love, a time of setting resolutions and all that, but um, self-love for me isn't you know, time for face masks or um, even working through self-esteem issues anymore. It's letting myself write as much as I can and without judgment. Judgment from myself or any of the imagined voices which would reject the results of the work, like it or dislike it or dismiss it entirely. The work is more than being loved for me because the work is how I love myself. And no matter what happens external of that, I'm stuck with me in this brain and I'd rather love myself than be loved by anyone else. The balances of that may change. I'd sort of like to try it out, but with a clearer foundation, I'll have less fear of falling if dropped. The page can always catch me. Worlds of words always accessible to break any potential fall. Um, apparently those were my notes from today. <laughs> yes, I get quite cerebral and like, 
lost in my brain for these videos. But again, I'm pretty much doing this instead of therapy at this point. It's much easier than having to try and find a therapist that would fit my needs. You know, that just, again, sounds like dating. And we all know I'm a little bit afraid of that, don't we? Um, something I wrote down the other day after, again, watching Little Women was I used to think I was a person who wrote sometimes. Now I have come to understand that I'm a writer who occasionally must be a person, truly an inconvenience. Um, so that's how I'm feeling these, <laughs> these days currently in January. Um, usually, again, I've said this in, before in this series, but like for some reason, like January, February are like pff, prime writing run months for me now. Like it's when I lose control of my brain entirely and like writing takes over. So I feel very much like this now, like a writer who must occasionally person as opposed to the other way around. Um, but you know, whatever. I, I didn't, you know, I never dreamed when I was a kid or like in high school, I didn't think I would be a writer. I didn't think I was a writer, but it kind of snuck up on me and here I am now I'm kind of a slave to it. And I'm aware that it's just spending hours and hours with your imaginary friends. The, you know, these characters that you invent, um, it's very much just like playing ima with imaginary friends only until it's just, it's just knitting until somebody publishes it. It's just sitting and indulging in very elaborate daydreams until someone else approves it, binds it and puts it on a shelf. Um, and so sometimes the struggle is being like, oh, am I just doing this futilely? Does it not matter? Is this a waste of time? But like, if it makes, if something makes you happy and doesn't hurt anybody else, I don't think that's a waste of time. I think that's like what it is to be living best as a human in some ways. Like the ideal of is like creating and playing with words or paint or ingredients, um, knitting, <laughs> making things. Uh, and if nobody else cares, it doesn't matter because you do. Right? Kind of. Anyway, as now that we've gotten very nebulous and weird again, um, I think I'll go. <laughs> so I'm going to go actually edit a chapter for the first chapter of a new book I'm working on. And that's what I'm going to do with the rest of my night. Thank you again for tuning into Side Hustlin' twice this week. Um, if you watch both of these long rambling videos, kind of detailing my psychosis, thank you. Um, and I will have some more slightly still personal content next week. Uh, I have a Q&A coming up and then my Patreon announcement video next week. So I will see you both. I will see you all for both of those then. Okay? <laughs> okay. Bye.